Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 46 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. In this episode, I talk with Greg Creech, one of the leading authorities on Japanese psychology in North America, about Japanese psychology, Buddhism, and how the two work together to help you through challenges, getting stuff done, deepening the practice of acceptance and gratitude, and particularly for today's times, how to deal with the uh, ongoing uncertainty we all live in and how to deal with the transitions it's causing in our life. Greg has been a virtual teacher to me for more than 10 years through his books, distance learning programs, the Toto Institute and the Toto Institute's journal, 30,000 Days. They've had a significant impact on my spiritual and psychological development for the better. I was first introduced to Greg and his work during my training with the Bright Dawn Lay Ministry program in uh, 2007 to 2008, and his book, Nikon, Gratitude, Grace, and the Japanese Art of Self-Reflection, served as the basis for one of our learning modules during that training. Um, And during that time, we did a month-long Nikon retreat where we shared our insights with class members. It was a very special time and um, it, 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 it's a time that grounded me in uh, Japanese psychology and opened my eyes to um, different ways of looking at the world. Since that time, his books and virtual classes have been an anchor for me during challenging life situations and also for using his daily reflections. Plus, as a coach, I've shared what I've learned with my coaching clients. I have discovered, and my clients have consistently remarked, that the practices of Japanese psychology have been more effective in working with persistent issues than other more common psychological methods like cognitive behavioral therapy and neuro-linguistic programming and some other um, approaches to dealing with issues in day-to-day life. Greg is an author and editor whose work has been featured on public radio in The Sun Magazine, Tricycle, Self, Utney Reader, Counseling Today, Cosmopolitan, and Experience Life. His book, Nikon, Gratitude, Grace, and the Japanese Art of Self-Reflection, won a Spirituality and Health Magazine Award for Best Books of 2002 and has been translated into five languages. His book, The Art of Taking Action, Lessons from Japanese Psychology, is an Amazon bestseller. He and his wife, Linda, are the founders of the Toto Institute, a nonprofit center in Vermont that uses Japanese psychology as an alternative to traditional Western approaches to psychology. His work is a blend of the psychological, the spiritual, the practical, Um, based on values such as purpose, gratitude, mindfulness, compassion, and constructive action or active acceptance, which we talk about quite a lot during this upcoming conversation. He is a member of the North American Nikon Council and editor of the quarterly journal 30,000 Days, a journal for purposeful living. I will post links to his books and his website, 30,000 Days, on the Everyday Buddhism website um, under the podcast uh, episode, and I hope everyone does check out the Toto Institute. It is a gold mine of resources to help make your days better, which is what this podcast is all about. And with that, let's get to the conversation with Greg. Let's not delay another minute. As the months of the pandemic drone on and on, and with it, the continuing uncertainty, finding places of peace has become an all-important focus uh, of life for many of us, I think. 
And I shared with you in the previous short episode that I've committed to a more consistent daily meditation practice as a way to take positive action rather than focus on all that is wrong in our country and the world. And the other thing I did was to reach out to my teacher and friend, Greg Creech, one of the leading authorities on Japanese psychology, to talk with me on this podcast episode about uncertainty and transitions. When we talked on the phone about what advice or practice he could offer to podcast listeners as we weathered this time of great uncertainty, he said something that really struck me. He said, it's not a mass issue. It's your personal situation and attachment. And then he went on to say that everyone is dealing with losses, but ultimately it's an individual thing. And so with that brief lead in, I want to welcome Greg to this podcast once again. Hi, Greg. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Wendy. Thank you for having me. It's nice to talk to you again. Okay, so great. Um, So I would like us to focus uh, much of the conversation today, and I, I think I mentioned this when we talked on one of your recent articles, Coping in the Garden of Uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And also, if we have any time left, maybe you could talk about your recent series focused on the challenges uh, posed by this uh, pandemic, which was um, life not on hold, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. (laughs) First, though, if you could unpack what I just shared from our recent conversation, which I hope I quoted you correctly, even if you remember what you said. Um, It's not a mass issue. It's your personal situation and attachment. And then everyone is dealing with losses, but ultimately it's an individual thing. So can you talk more about those concepts, Greg? Well, um, first of all, I, I do think that it's an unusual situation because in terms of the pandemic, um, that uh, the whole world is um, suffering from this. Uh, And obviously some people are suffering in different ways or more Mm -hmm. or less, but but, um, we all all are exposed to the situation. And and so I'm not trying to suggest that that it's anything but a global, threat to our lives and to our health. And, uh, but I think in terms of how we cope with it, uh, it, it really is uh, very much an individual issue. It has to do with our own practice. It has to do with what presses our buttons. Um, it has to do with what uh, um, we miss that gives us a, a sense of impatience and agitation because we have such a strong desire to have X and we can't have it right now because of the conditions of of our lives and the world. So in that sense, our ability to work with the situation, to cope with it, um, to find a way to accept what we can't change, for example, um, those kinds of things that are coming up are individual issues and the kinds of things that will push your buttons or agitate you or uh, frustrate you uh, (laughs) at, at an extreme, are probably not necessarily the things that are going to have that effect on me, but I have my own things. Um, and so to that extent, the, the solutions that we're looking for, while we can talk about a vaccine as a solution to the medical problem, but the solution to our, our practical and spiritual issues that we're facing in our own lives really is a question of, of coping with that as an individual. And I think of it similarly when I think of, of coping with the issue of death. Right. Well, right, right. That, right. Uh, that uh, we we all will die. Uh, it's a given. But um, but how we die and how we face and cope with our our own individual death is something that we can't share with anybody else. Right. It's something that we have to work with um, as as an individual. Um, and I think uh, in that sense, the situation we find ourselves in now uh, is is somewhat parallel to that. Yeah, that is that's really a very good point because I was trying to I was trying to think of a parallel to to what you were saying because I, I really couldn't find one in the average everyday life, but I overlooked like the biggie, right? Death. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that that is that that's absolutely true. Um, in in you know in your article you, you actually uh, quoted um, 
uh, Zigar Kangru Rinpoche, which I really love this. Um, and I would like to lead, read the first paragraph from the co- quotation um, mm-hmm. because uh, I, I think it says, it speaks to a lot of what we're talking about here. We could be, help us jump into it, but, um, and, and, it's the it's the sense of having these ego bubbles that keep us sealed in a false sense of security. You know, all of us, um, this is the quote, all of us, whether we want to or not, live in a bubble. This is our own version of reality created by our ego, which is always turning away from the open-ended nature of how things are while trying to ma- maintain the familiar. Most of the time, we are able to keep this sense of familiarity intact. Um, Everything in our bubble is fairly predictable and seems to make sense. Even if we're going through a hard time at some level, we're able to hold it all together, unquote. Now, I think this is, this really gets to the heart of a lot of this. And it it actually um, speaks to how people deal with death. Uh, Some people bubble themselves or uh, away from the concept and avoid it altogether. And our society, of course, makes that all too easy to do um, in that death is hidden in most cases or, uh, and life is prolonged at all costs. <clears throat> but, but I think this emphasizes the, our inherent ignorance, and I mean ignorance from the Buddhist term, not that we're all stupid, or avoidance of the three marks of existence, you know, impermanence, suffering, and no self or non-self. And I'll add emptiness to that because that is sometimes included in this overview. But, you know, life is made of these things, but we choose to create this bubble anyway, or a version of reality, as Rinpoche said, um, that keeps us protected in an illusion that those three marks aren't true. We just tend to forget it or don't, don't want to even look at it. And what this quote gets at in the last sentence, that quote, even if we're going through a hard time at some level, we're able to hold it all together. And that is kind of referring to most of our daily challenges with impermanent suffering and lack of a discrete, unchanging self or a discrete, unchanging reality. And so we are confident, like it'll end and everything will go back to normal. And yet, in this current, you know, co-mingled crisis of pandemic, economic collapse, heightened social unrest, uh, divisiveness and conflict, you know, we're faced with a mix of uncertainties that I think are far worse and unlike anything most of us have faced in our lifetimes. So, can you say more about these bubbles? And then maybe we can get into what we can do now that all of our bubbles have burst. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think that the bubbles are kind of, our, our bubbles are, are kind of a form of um, the, the karmic result of uh, all of the years or decades for some of us that we have spent trying to make our lives comfortable and trying to get them to fit with how we want to live. Right. Right. And so we spend, you know, everything from oh, you buy a plant and oh, it looks better on this shelf than it does over here. Right. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, where we choose to live in terms of our home. I, I live in the country. I, I love living in the country around birds and hearing coyotes at night and things like that. Um, and and so uh, so we try to kind of create this little nest um, and <clears throat> and for many of us, you know, it. it it becomes more comfortable to be in that bubble mm-hmm. uh, or that nest than to be out of it. Uh, and I think when the uh, pandemic um, kind of uh, hit us, and I've thought about this in terms of a bubble and as a metaphor that it, it, the pandemic didn't really burst our bubble. It kind of slowly dissolved it, right? Because, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, <clears throat> it happened over a period of time and it's still happening over a period of time. And uh, so it's not like we were sitting in, in our bubble and suddenly someone took a pin and burst it like a balloon. It's kind of just like melted away. <laughs> and um, suddenly it, it, it's not there anymore. And, and what's not there is um, the lifestyle that we had, right? Being able to see our friends, being able to see our family, being able to uh, um, go out and go shopping with, without a mask on, being able to eat dinner in a restaurant, 
Uh, I, and as most of you know, I could go on and on the description of what's different now. Um, and what's different now is what we have instead of the bubble that we built. Um, and so, uh, so our challenge now is to figure out how to cope uh, in a situation where that bubble has, to, to some extent or a great extent, kind of dissolved. And it's left us with this, right? And, and okay. what this is is different for all of us. Um, but that's what it's left us with. And so um, we have to try to uh, adapt to the change, the, the impermanence of life kind of showing up and saying, we're going to make some big changes very quickly in, in, in the whole world, not just in your life, but in the whole world. But of course, our life is, is the one that's in this particular bubble. And so we have to adapt now. And how are we going to do that? And um, how much suffering are we going to create for ourselves? How much suffering are we going to create for people around us? Um, how open are we to acknowledging that we're not the only ones who are suffering? We're not the only person, not the only person who's suffering, that there's a great suffering in the world right now. Um, so all of these things come up for us, which becomes essentially the, the foundation of our practice. You know, our practice really has become our, our daily life. And, um, uh, and it's a, a challenge for most of us because uh, things, often when something even, even big happens in our life, we get diagnosed with cancer or um, someone we, we love very much dies, but, but a lot of the rest of our life is anchored the way that it was, right? right. So we have some anchor, but in this case, um, it's kind of like the, the anchor um, just got cut off, right? And, uh, and it's hard to find a place that we can anchor ourselves. So, uh, so we find ourselves, I think, in a real spiritual quandary of, of mm -hmm. what can we grab onto. And Pema Chodron, and by the way, the quote you gave from Sigar Comtrul Rinpoche, for those of, of your listeners who aren't familiar with him, uh, he's a Tibetan Buddhist teacher and is often referred to as, by Pema Chodron as her teacher. Um, <clears throat> but she talks about this concept of groundlessness, right? Right. That, um, we come up against moments in our life, and for many of us, these past few months may have had some of these moments where there's just nothing to grab onto. Right, that right. We, we just we just can't grab onto anything uh, that really gives us a sense of security and control. Um, and I think the kinds of themes that have come up for me and, and other people that I'm uh, familiar with some of my students are, are themes like control, themes like attachment, um, themes like security, right? Um, these are all things that have come up because our buttons have been pressed. And, um, and so what happens when we, we feel, for instance, like we're losing control, our natural response is often to try to get back control, right? And how do we do that? We, we use more effort, right? We make more of an effort. But in many cases, um, effort is not the answer to getting back control. Um, and getting back control is not the answer to having lost control. So, um, <laughs> so in some cases, that, that, respond, that natural response of trying to regain control works against us. And yeah. I think that that's the, the, the challenge in terms of, of wisdom is how can we separate the situations in our life right now? You just mentioned you know, the economic situation, the civil unrest, the political um, conflict going on and the, the virus itself, how can we separate the different elements of this whole um, set of conditions uh, into those which, which we can actually assert some control or influence and those in which we just simply have to accept that what we're facing is really outside of our control or influence. And that's, that's a really great question for us to be sitting with as we look at the different problems and challenges that are kind of coming up in our life right now. How can, yeah, how can we separate that? That's an interesting, um, and you're right, that's, that is sort of our um, m main challenge, if you will, is, is to maintain our daily life as, as some sort of a productive, active practice while separating ourselves from that. But the word separate kind of struck me because I know um, 
this is, I mean, you know, to me, it almost sounds like, and I know you're an Eastern psychology person rather than a Western psychology person. So, um, you know, don't jump down my throat that I'm using Western psychology terms here, but <laughs> it's like, it's like compartmentalizing, if you will, you know, and, and some people find, say compartmentalization is a, uh, can be a, it can be a negative thing or a deterrent to a good life. I find compartmentalization in my life is, is, is a pretty good skill sometimes. Um, and, but to me, it means just not, in a way, it's just not focusing on all of that all the time. Which is, I you know, some people have talked talk about it. Uh, what is it? Um, uh, disaster scrolling. When you scroll through Twitter or Facebook for all the latest disastrous things, uh, and and that seemed to be everybody's first instinct during uh, the beginning of the pandemic is is looking for all the new information until we realized that none of it was any of it meant anything anyway. So, so yeah, there, that compartmentalization in my way of thinking of things is that, that uh, one way is that I'm trying to deal with it is to, is to uh, put it in a, in a, like a closet, some, a lot of the stuff in a little closet and I only peek in once in a while and then shut the door when I find myself getting agitated. Is that what you're referring to, kind of? Um, <clears throat> well, I would say, that, let, me, let me use a, um, one of our own maxims in Japanese psychology, which is this maxim, your experience of life is not based on your life, but on what you pay attention to. Right. Um, so your experience of life is not based on your life, but on what you pay attention to. And I think it's a, a really wonderful maxim um, for these times because um, we part of what we have to do in addition to trying to influence or change things that are changeable is to basically maintain our own sanity. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and somebody who spends every waking moment scrolling through the news and scrolling through Twitter feeds and Facebook events and everything and, and reading uh, every, every possible perspective on every element of suffering that's going on is going to have a tough time maintaining their sanity. Yeah. And, so, um, and so one of the things that we want to do is to be start working with our attention, which means uh, in the beginning to become aware of where we're putting our attention, right? Yeah. And, um, and I think that that, that in itself uh, we could spend the whole conversation and more just talking about this issue of working with our attention under these kinds of conditions. Because yeah. uh, if, <clears throat> if you um, get up in the morning and uh, the first thing that you're aware of, I'll give you an example from in terms of my own situation, which is uh, last January, so about 18 months ago, uh, I had a replacement knee surgery for my right knee. And for years prior to that time, I, I not only had pain, but I, my, my knee wasn't actually functioning correctly. It kind of bent out instead of uh, the way it's supposed to, to bend. And uh, so I had difficulty just getting up and down stairs uh, and things. And now I get out of bed. And when I walk to the bathroom, even though it's, it's been 18 months, I'm so aware of of what a wonderful thing it is just to be able to walk to the bathroom from my bed without, <laughs> without even having to be conscious of any, any difficulty or pain or discomfort in my knee. And so um, most of us, when we get out of bed and walk to the bathroom, probably don't think, oh, I'm so glad that my knees are working, <laughs> right? Um, but if you, if you have knee problems like, like I did and like many people do, one of the things you're doing is you're getting out of bed and as soon as you stand up, you're going, oh, my knee. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a really wonderful example of what happens with our attention. When something isn't working, we pay attention to it. And when something is working, um, we tend to not notice it. And we tend to not notice it because we notice something else that isn't working, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, so we have uh, Rick Hansen, uh, who, who's uh, kind of a Buddhist neuroscientist, um, is, yeah. is the kind of characterization I would have of his work. Uh, he uses this term negative bias. We have this negative yes. bias in our attention. It's, it's the way our attention in our brain actually works. So if we don't do something consciously 
to work with our attention and to counter that negative bias, then this becomes essentially our day. Just noticing one thing after another that is undesirable, that's unpleasant, that's, that's painful, that's uncomfortable, that's causing us problems. And that becomes our experience of life. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. I, I, I'm familiar with Hansen's work and the negative bias because that is so true. And it, once you're aware of it, it, it really changes everything, how you look at things. Once you're aware of that, that you have that negative bias. You don't think that that's what's going on, but that's what's going on. And the other thing I will say is um, I, I was diagnosed, I have a chronic illness, a systemic lupus, so I'm also... Um, immune compromised, which makes the situation even more scary for me. Uh, and plus I'm over 65 and all those other things. But one of the, uh, it, some people have asked me, you know, what, what about the chronic illness? I said it was the greatest gift that I was ever given because I was it, just like you said about your knee is like the days that I get up feeling well, rested and ready to go are like the, Christmas, right? <laughs> they're, 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 they're awesome. And have being able to see the other side of that uh, not only increases your comp compassion, but increases your ability to have gratitude for like the smallest, smallest things. And, and so I think, um, uh, you know, you, you use, I wouldn't, I don't use the word compartmentalize, but it's, yeah. it's fine. And, and, uh, but I think that the only way that we encounter reality is is moment by moment, right? Mm. So you know we don't we don't encounter um, the world, we don't encounter the <laughs> pandemic, right? You know we we encounter um, this particular news article, we encounter the coffee maker not working in the morning, or <laughs> our car doesn't start. So reality kind of encounters us. You know we have we have our our meetings with reality on a moment <laughs> by moment basis. And, um, and how we use our attention in those moments and whether we're consciously working with our attention and directing our attention uh, or, or whether we're just essentially allowing our attention to kind of do whatever it wants to do um, and kind of run wild. You know, we, we just, uh, my daughter who's 22 is living with us and um, uh, she finally got me to agree to allow her to adopt a, a puppy. So oh no! <laughs> we have a 14-week-old puppy. This this sweet, sweet, wonderful puppy who is just wild. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> what they are. The house and uh, um, and on the one hand, I, and I love dogs. I, I've had two dogs in my life who were like children to me. Um, but it's changed our bubble. <laughs> yes, <laughs> having this puppy in our bubble. But it, it, you know, I think of the mind where we, we aren't trying to work with our attention as this wild puppy mind, right? It just <laughs> goes wherever it's want to go. You can call it. It doesn't listen to you. You know, it, if you don't keep, if you don't basically notice it constantly, it's chewing on the couch or it's, it's eating, you know, your tax return that you haven't filed yet or something. And, and, and our mile, our minds are like that. And working with our attention means that we begin to consciously direct our attention to this instead of that. So that yes. in moments, as we encounter each moment, um, we're actually having some control over how we encounter that moment and what by, by controlling what we pay attention to. Uh, and when we talk about, for instance, the issue of gratitude, uh, that gets us into this practice, which I know you're familiar with, called Nikon, mm -hmm. which is a, a Japanese method of self-reflection. And it's something that my wife and I, uh, now we have a little morning routine that we've been doing for years, but we're actually more uh, committed to it now since the pandemic. And one of the things we do is we do about five minutes of self-reflection on each other, which um, keeps us sane and it keeps us from killing one another. <laughs> um, so, uh, but it's a wonderful relationship practice in which um, we we, funk, we get our attention to focus on these questions. You know, what did I receive from my wife, Linda? What did I give to her? Um, and what troubles and difficulties did I cause her? And we just look at the previous 24 hours. And then we um, express that to, to one another. And the whole process, uh, we spend three or four minutes reflecting and three or four minutes um, expressing. And so it's 10 minutes or less every morning. 
but it's one of the most wonderful things that we do because it really shifts our attention because in, in many cases when you're living with someone particularly in, in a situation where you're much more confined to your um, space that you're sharing um, you your attention begins to, to gravitate towards what this person is doing that's really aggravating you right? Right. <laughs> or what they're not doing that's really <laughs> aggravating you. Those are your kind of two, <laughs> two focal points. And um, I think having this practice in which you're consciously directing your attention towards wh what did Linda do yesterday that actually supported me, right? And, um, and what did I do that caused her trouble, problems, inconvenience? That's not a question my attention normally goes to. Um, so, so Nikon becomes one of the ways that we actually shift or control um, our attention. And it changes our experience in a relationship. It changes our experience of, of the relationship. Um, so I think there's lots of ways to work with our attention that really are a wonderful way of anchoring ourselves, not anchoring ourselves in, you know, how much money do we have in the bank or, or um, uh, you know, material kind of comfort but anchoring ourselves in the reality of what life is actually like, um, because it's not all suffering. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh used to always remind us um, decades ago when I, when I spent some time with him traveling, he used to always remind us that, yes, you know, in Buddhism, life is suffering, but suffering is not all there is. Yes. And so we have to, under these circumstances, be able to find those little windows of suffering is not all there is. Well, I love... Well, I loved everything you said, but uh, that you gave such positive steps uh, or actions, um, and, and that's something that you you also teach is about action. Um, but that not using Nikon uh, at this time uh, w with the people you're living with, and I am definitely going to adopt this because I have been finding that our partnership is more challenged. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, because you know, even though we we both worked at home, we were always together anyway. There was somebody was always going somewhere, you know, and mm -hmm. there was time away, and it was you know that it just was a whole different thing. I, and it, it's amazing, really. I've reflected on this a lot. Is how amazing is that? I never thought that any we never really went anywhere a lot, but it it really did change the whole the energy of how the day goes mm -hmm. strangely. So I like that starting the day that way. Like um, is a real is a really good thing because it, it it's a great reminder of to be looking out for those things all the next twenty four hours, right? <laughs> for for your for your next morning session. So that's wonderful and and. Um, I'm glad you shared that. So maybe everybody can save their relationships this way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, you know, in that article that we were referring to, um, you you suggest acceptance, and you've talked about this uh, previously here as a strategy. And then you went on to list some capabilities. And some of these you actually sort of mentioned in some of the things we've been talking about. Um, you went on to list some capabilities that... Uh, if we dug deeper, we could find that would help us uh, if we would actively apply them during this time. So I'll list them. And I, whether you remember this, the details of the article or not, I, uh, if, if not, you know, tell me and I'll read a little more of it so that I could remind you, but um, I'll list them. Um, but first talk a little bit more about active acceptance. I know you've already sort of talked about this a little bit or referred to it in your, you know, the previous things you've been talking about, but, you know, I've, I've talked about all this a lot in my podcast and I think we talked about it in, in the previous podcast episode I had with you, but, you know, acceptance is most people really have a, in the West, a really, really rotten uh, connotation around the word acceptance as resignation. And, and I think a lot of people actually are, think that the pandemic sort of, that, that's, that resignation type acceptance is what they're dealing with. But their acceptance in the way you refer to it, in the way I refer to it, is, is much more active. Um, um, so if you could talk a little bit about acceptance and then move on to the first capability, because I think they may be tied, uh, the, of the list in your article was waking up our faith. 
And um, I call that the F word on this podcast because so many people <laughs> come to a, me if I have a, the secular root. So they, they kind of maybe have a, a, a bad relationship with that word. But I think there's a lot, a lot of good uh, that can be talked about here. So if you remember those two things, I'll leave it up to you. Okay. Well, let, let me say something about acceptance and then you can, you can remind me about the F word after that. Oh. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Um, so, so another method of Japanese psychology that uh, I know you're familiar with, Wendy, is Morita therapy. And Morita therapy was developed by a Japanese psychiatrist in the early 20th century, and it, it's kind of rooted in to some degree in, in Zen principles, though it's not religious at all. Um, and it's, it's sometimes referred to as the psychology of action because it's much more about taking action than it is about talking. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> However, the, uh, the underlying uh, principle in Morita's work <clears throat> is really this um, term in Japanese that's, that's uh, arugamama, arugamama, and uh, a translation into English would be something like to accept things as they are or things just as they are, right? Um, and that's really a, a state uh, in, in which Morita is trying to lead you, right? A mm -hmm. state, to be in a state of arugamama. Um, and it's very similar to uh, this, this kind of core structure of Morita's work. It, it, in some way, is similar to the serenity prayer because it does have you look at, you know, um, what do you need to, to be able to accept, have the serenity to accept, and what do you need to have the courage to actually change and, and influence? Um, and And... How, how can you have the wisdom to know the difference? And so, um, so on the acceptance side of Marita's work is this concept of arugamama, to accept things as they are. But it, it's not necessarily where you have to stop um, because that's, acceptance isn't, uh, in my opinion, um, exclusively passive, right? Right. So, um, but it's where you have to start. And in, in many ways, uh, you can't really take action, at least effective action, until you have um, accepted the reality of the situation that you're in. Right? Mm. So, um, so you think about uh, um, would be a good example. Let's say being diagnosed with a um, a serious or a chronic illness, right? And <clears throat> it's not that you accept it and you just say, oh, well, you know, and now I have this illness. I guess I'll just just kind of lay in bed until I die. Right? <laughs> that would be uh, in a different term, which is resignation, right? We just resign ourselves that we have an illness and we're going to die. But acceptance is really the acceptance of the reality of the situation, okay? That I have this, this disease, I have this illness, this is the state of my health. Um, but then it, it, you know, it opens up the possibility of, is there something that I need to do? Right. right? And in, in some cases, and maybe in many cases, there is something you, you can or need to do. And in some cases, there isn't, right? <laughs> if you're faced with the death of a loved one, for example, um, there really isn't something you need to do. If you're faced with the threat to your health and your life from um, a deadly virus, then uh, one of the things maybe you need to do when you go out is wear a mask or social distance or go to supermarket when it's least busy, right? Um, and so there are things that you can do, um, but uh, ultimately um, you're still faced with a situation that's, that's uncontrollable. But you have to start by accepting the situation. And um, uh, you know, I think that part of what's going on in the US with the virus, and I'll be just very upfront about my own views about this, is that we have a large or not large, but significant portion of society who has not accepted the situation. Absolutely. Right? Um, and <clears throat> there's a difference between accepting the facts of the situation and accepting um, judgments of what course we need to take, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the number of infections, when we look at the rate of, of infections for people who are tested, when we look at the number of deaths, um, <clears throat> those things are facts. You know, when we look at the level of contagion, contagiousness of the disease, those things are facts. 
Um, and, and so this, this virus is not a hoax in the sense that you know, we've, we've already had over 150,000 people die from it um, and, and expect that there'll be um, uh, more. So, um, so accepting that this is a contagious disease, that it can kill people, that even when it doesn't kill people, it can leave you with um, short and long-term uh, health problems, right? These are all, all things that are facts of the situation that I think we need to accept. And we do have a, a portion of society that just doesn't accept this situation. Now, for those of you who <clears throat> do accept the situation, it's easy to look at those people and say, well, they're, they're just fools. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they that's don't right. accept the situation. But I also, I think that the situation is more subtle because um, what I see is a number of people now who are responding to the situation. Also, the same, the same people who say, yeah, this is a serious um, problem, this virus, and you, know, you can get sick and you can go to the hospital and you can die and you can have long-term health effects. But the impatience that we have mm -hmm. with the time it's taking for us to figure out how to resolve this health situation, that impatience is often um, stimulating people to make choices and cha and do things in their life that really aren't conducive to the threat that's being posed. Absolutely. Right? And and so even those of us who um, are saying, well, you've got to, yeah, yeah, this is a real situation. It's not a hoax. We need to accept it. Um, in a more subtle ways, there's things that we aren't accepting. And why? Because we don't like it. <laughs> because we're impatient and because we're attached to having life be a certain way, and we don't like the fact that life is a different way. Um, so most of us, if we really were able to examine our own conduct, our own preferences, our desires, our attachments, would find things that we're having difficulty accepting. Um, it's always easier to see that in other people. It's always harder to see it in ourselves. <laughs> but most of us, um, if we were honest, could actually find some of those things. So that's, that's a huge challenge for us. Um, is to start with acceptance. And I'm just using the, the, uh, um, the pandemic as, a, as one example of that, right? And, and there's many other things going on that we could bring in as examples. Um, but it's not a passive situation because it opens up then the question now that we're anchored in the way things are and we've accepted it, is there something that we need to do? And that's the active um, energy that comes from acceptance. Uh, and we're much more likely to be effective once we've accepted something as reality and then, then looked at how we can take action. We're much more likely to be effective than if we're just essentially ignoring or denying that reality and just kind of continuing with our lives as if the situation doesn't exist. Yeah, that, that's so true. And, and that really was a, a wonderful how you distinguished between the two sort of parts of it, you know, the first, the first acceptance of the, of things as they are. And mm -hmm. then, and then, uh, then the sort of the, the, the serenity prayer, prayers, 12 step analysis kind of thing is, can I, what can I do about this? If anything, and if I can, well, actually a master Shanti Davis said that I think in his book, the same thing, if there's something you can do about it, do it. If, if not, then don't don't dwell on it right uh -huh. um and that's pretty much it um and you one thing what you mentioned that really caught me is that and i've noticed this more on following the trend of people's comments on social media is that um even those that did did accept it as as a, a true factual thing and that that did and then took all the right actions are now starting to um, it's like pointing to the other person. Why are all these other people going and visiting families and why are they having cookouts and how come I'm still doing stuck at home? It's kind of this is you see where the acceptance level is breaking down, right? Huh. It's like, they just like, uh, they're starting to look outside and blaming everybody else for the fact that they're still stuck inside when really, if they looked at it, they should know that that's still the right action to take, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've seen that drift uh, in the last maybe two, three, four weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, um, uh, you know, there's, first of all, there, there's a lot of pressure that comes from basically watching people do things that we would like to do. 
um, that kind of pulls us in that direction. And there's a lot of pressure internally that comes from the sense of impatience. You know, I want to be able to um, go out and, and, you know, into a, a restaurant and listen to music. I want to be able to, to eat out. You know, I want to be able to see family, you know, and friends and not, and not just basically um, walk with them with, you know, six feet apart, right, from us. Right. And, uh, and so, um, so part of what we see here is this idea of um, acting on our feelings. And that's another aspect of Marita therapy, which Marita therapy suggests that um, uh, it's not a good idea to make your actions primarily or exclusively based on your feeling state, right? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So when you feel, whether it's impatience, whether it's anger, whether, you know, it's uh, um, uh, despair or depression, um, it's not a good thing to be making choices based on um, particularly strong emotional state. Because as we all know, particularly if you're, if you're working with some kind of practice, that feeling state can change dramatically one minute to another, right? right? And we don't want to make important decisions when we have strong emotions and feelings that are kind of coursing through our, our minds and hearts. Um, and so, uh, but, but it's very, we're, we're seduced into doing that when we feel impatient with something that we really want and we see it out there and we see other people getting it <laughs> and we think, I want that. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to have that. Um, and so we can easily make choices that may not necessarily be wise choices as we look back at them. Um, so, so having those feelings is fine, um, but we don't want to essentially succumb to just simply reacting to those feelings uh, in terms of how we live. And making bad choices, exactly. So now we're going to circle back to the, I threw off, off track a little bit with that, but um, the, the, the first thing on your list was waking up our faith, the F word. So um, can you say a little more about that first step? And if you want me to read more of your article about that, I'm happy to do that. Um, if you can't remember what, what you wrote. Yeah, I almost never remember what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, I, and that's what I, I kind of don't remember. People always say, you know, in your book, when you wrote about this, it's like, tell me what did i say yeah. so Some, did you sometimes sometimes if it's if what i wrote if if i hear someone read it and i think and and it sounds like it's actually pretty good i think like wow i wrote that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah or in my case sometimes it's like oh i wrote that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if there if there's something that you want to share from what I wrote, um, I would, I would be happy to have you. Well, you actually didn't it. on this. You just said, uh, okay. we need to wake up our faith. And so okay. that's why I need you to talk about it. It was okay. really sort of uh, succinct and, uh, and uh, because it included the F word, I, I thought maybe it would be nice to have you explain this and what you mean. Okay. So um, my own background in Buddhism is, is uh, both um, in Zen practice as well as uh, Shin Buddhist practice or Pure Land practice, mm -hmm. and um, they're very different um, in terms of how they look at the world. Although um, I, I do have a sense that they kind of um, try to encourage you to get to ultimately the same place, but very different paths. And um, you don't see a lot of discussion about faith in Zen Buddhism, but you do in in Pure Land or Shin Buddhism. Right. Um, <laughs> um, and so in Shin Buddhism, um, there's a term called Shinjin mm -hmm. that used to be translated as faith. But uh, the more accepted translation in the past you know, 20 years or so is uh, true and trusting. And, and I like that, true and trusting. I like the, the idea of having the word trust um, in there, right? Uh, rather than the, the term faith at all, because faith tends to immediately get us to think about things from kind of a Christian perspective. Right. And I don't think that that's really what um, uh, Buddhism, at least Shin Buddhism, is, is asking us to understand about that term. Um, it's more about trusting. Right. Um, and the first thing I think that comes up when I think about um, this true and trusting or, or faith um, is that uh, it, it isn't about this idea of having faith 
that um, I'm going to be okay. You know, if, if you if you have an illness, if there's an accident, if something there's some tragedy in your life, you know, that it's the faith that somehow uh, um, some higher power like God or Buddha or something is is going to take care of you and you'll be okay. Um, <clears throat> to me, uh, this true and trusting um, is more of a sense of trusting that the world will unfold the way that it will unfold, right? Right. That things will unfold um, in the way that they are supposed to or need to unfold. Um, and it's not something that you have to always be manipulating. And um, specifically in Shin Buddhism, I remember this reference, I, I, I can't quote it in any scholarly way, but the idea um, that Shinran, the founder of, of uh, um, Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, that he, he talked about the idea of kind of um, our efforts to always manipulate the situation. To, to you look at a situation and you just, you're trying to figure out, well, how can I get this to work out best for me? Right. 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 And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's when you're, when your kids are young and the, the tickets to the, um, to the fair, you know, are uh, half price if your child is, um, uh, is under 12, but your child just turned 12 yesterday, you know? And so you begin thinking about like, well, you know, if I just tell them my child is, is still 11, then I can pay the half price amount, right? And but we do this in, in so many different ways that, that we face situations and we think, well, this is how I want the situation to play out. So what can I do to get this to happen? And, it, and life becomes like a chess game, right? Yeah. Always trying to figure out the best move so that you can end up winning the game. And so Shijin, or true and trusting to me, is, is almost like the opposite of a chess game, is that you, you stop playing chess. You know, you, you work with the sense that, that life will unfold, and it will unfold in a way that, that's okay. Not necessarily in a way that will make me happy or even healthy, but in a way that's okay. And, um, and so we learn how to relax into the unfolding of life instead of the tension that comes with always trying to figure out what our next move is to try to get the outcome that we're looking for. And um, uh, if I ever finish this, this book, I've been writing a book for probably about 10 years now, which has <laughs> had different names, but the, the name that it has at this moment is something about, that uses this phrase, the softer side of Buddhism. And that's wow. the way that, that I look at certain traditions like Shin Buddhism or Pure Land Buddhism, um, because it, it's this idea of being able to relax into the unfolding in life of life, instead of having to always um, try to get things to work out the way you want them to work out. Now, having said that, I have a little plaque that was given to me by a, a Zen center 20 years ago where I gave a talk. That's a, a nice little poem from uh, the Zen monk Ryokan. Um, that's all about this idea of relaxing into life. So again, it's not like there's this, this clear separation between uh, Shin Buddhism and, and Zen Buddhism, but Shin Buddhism tends to talk more about this issue of, of trust and true and trusting and faith and um, <clears throat> being okay with allowing the, the life to unfold instead of this, this sense that if we don't take care of this, the world's going to fall apart. And if you're a parent and you have children, you know exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. right? It's yeah. like, oh my God, my kids got a problem or my kid's in trouble. And if I don't do something to fix the situation, their life is just going to fall apart, right? Right, and, right. And even if you don't do it, you, you have, many of us have that energy. We feel mm -hmm. the energy of wanting to intervene and keep them from dealing with the unfolding of life, right? And, yeah. and when the unfolding in, of life is that there's a truck coming down the road and they're standing in the middle of the road, I'm not arguing that you shouldn't, jump out there and, and grab them and get them out of the way. Right. But I'm talking about the other 99% of the things that happen to your kids, right? Right. Where, um, where there's this option of trusting life, that, that life as a teacher is teaching each of us, including our children, right? And, um, and not necessarily always intervening, whether um, it's, it's in the lesson that life's trying to teach me or the lesson that life's trying to teach my children, or other loved ones or family members or, or just other people in general. Um, 
And when I am grounded in this idea of true and trusting or faith, um, I find that I'm so much more relaxed and at ease with my life as it is. And in the moments where I'm on the other side of the world and I feel like I've got to take care of this or fix this, or if I don't, things are going to fall apart. I am tense, I'm anxious, I'm agitated. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in a completely different state. Um, and so there's a great, I think, uh, um, beauty, you know, in this aspect of Buddhism that allows us to cultivate this sense of, of true and trusting or faith. And I think particularly in situations where we are up against things that we really can't control or even right. influence very much. Yeah, it's, you know, well, you know, as you know, I came from the Bright Dawn method of teaching, which is pretty much a Shin Zen hybrid um, mm -hmm. because it comes from both the trainings of both uh, Reverend Koyo Kabose and his father, Gyome Kabose, who trained in both things. Um, and um, there's a very strong Pure Land uh, and Jodo Shinshu influence there, although it's not always... Uh, it's it's emphasized more through everyday teachings rather than emphasized through the, the the scholarly traditions. But it was when you know I came from a Tibetan tradition and went to uh, and then was I call it my born again Buddhist moment when it, when I was exposed to Shin Buddhism and it changed everything for me. Um, uh, it, and it was in fact the true and trusting part of it that changed everything for me. And it was in a talk uh, at the at the time. Uh, Rev Reverend Al Bloom, the late Reverend Al Bloom, um, talked to our class, um, and um, I, I had that's when I had my born again Shin mom moment because I, I I asked him, please ex explain more about self power versus other power because I really had an, a, a terrible misunderstanding about it and thought of other power as sort of like the God thing, you know, and it was, it was, you know, it was very confusing for me and, and, and uh, like Reese pig, like I would get it and then I wouldn't get it and then I would get it and I wouldn't get it. And, and he, he gave all these little anecdotes and one of which was a, and I've told this story before, but just that there was a woodpecker on a tree and, and he was pecking away, pecking away, pecking away, but he had no idea there was, there were loggers below. And, um, and then <clears throat> all of a sudden the tree was felled. And he said, wow, I did that. Uh, so, so that was like an elucidating moment for me that life will uh, unfold the way it will unfold. And sometimes it'll be good for you, sometimes it'll be bad for you, but it's still just life <clears throat> unfolding. And that's the, the true and trusting really helps you not be so, um, first of all, focused on what you can do about the situation or what you can't do about the situation. And also not so focused on, um, the direct outcome of whatever you do. So thank you for, for that story and, and for elucidating the F word to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. And, and the, the only thing I want to add to it is that again, there, there's no, um, uh, there's nothing that, that prevents you from taking action because it's, it's not right. that, um, that life in, in the state of, faith or true and trusting is a passive life. Um, and when I've talked about this in, in front of um, Shin Buddhist audiences, I point out that the, the founders and the leaders of this form of Buddhism were really active, <laughs> yes. active people, you know? And um, <clears throat> uh, so it's not that it prevents you from taking action. Um, it, it simply means it's much more of um, taking action because um, it's important for you to do that. But there's a sense that um, uh, that there's not an attachment to the outcome, and even when you get an outcome that maybe you prefer or desire, <laughs> um, you you see that in large part as um, a blessing or good fortune, you know, that comes from not just your own efforts, but basically from the world's collaboration with that effort right which was the 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 the, the lumberjacks and the woodpecker that's mm -hmm. exactly right and mm -hmm. just thought that was the beautiful story yes. um yes. this the second one and and we're going to probably have to clip through these if we want, want to keep this <laughs> but um but you're doing I, i'm loving this because you are really um 
giving direct actions. And this is what I think people are just really needing and wanting uh, at this time. They just, they don't know where to turn really. And, uh -huh. and, 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 you know, I've done a lot of podcasts sort of like being, um, yeah, you know, it's really bad, and you know, and, and trying to give a few little things, but there's, it always, we always see, I always want to give them more that, that they can act, they can act on or work with. So this, one of the things now after, after the faith is uh, sharpen our skills of reflecting on ourselves and noticing how our conduct affects others. You sort of hinted at this a little bit with your new, more, um, active Nikon practice with your wife in the morning. Um, but if you want to say a few more things on this topic, that would be great. Well, I think that um, uh, people can read it in more detail about Nikon, but it really, it, the core of it is really these three simple reflective questions. And the first is what have I received either from the other person or from the world as a, you know, the world itself. Um, when you do just a daily Nikon reflection, the second question is, what have I given? Um, and the third question, which is the most difficult, is what troubles and difficulties have I caused? And um, when people talk to me about kind of the, the Western version of like a gratitude journal, right. which is really the first question in my kind, there's nothing wrong with a gratitude journal. It's a great thing to do. <clears throat> but what it doesn't um, address is this issue of um, seeing how what I'm doing is affecting other people and the, right. and the world around me, not just other people, but animals, nature, global warming, everything, right? Right, right. And it's the third question of looking at how have I caused trouble and difficulty that really addresses this issue um, uh, and potentially gives birth to um, compassion for others. Because the only way we can successfully answer this question of how, how did I cause trouble or difficulty to someone is by putting ourselves in that person's shoes. Yeah. So what is it like to be uh, Wendy interviewing me? What is it like to be this little puppy that's <laughs> running around the house um, trying to have fun and having to deal with me when I'm trying to get ready for a podcast? Um, <laughs> and so we put ourselves in the other person's or puppy's shoes and, uh, and we try to think, you know, what is it like for that person? What's their experience of dealing with me, right? So yeah. <laughs> in a relationship, I'm always looking at, you know, what is it like for me to be married to my wife, right? That's right. like the natural thing that comes up for me constantly. But the question of what is it like for my wife to be married to me, right, today, yeah. um, that's not a question that comes up naturally. And when I actually ask it out loud, it's a scary question. <laughs> Yes, I, it is. I immediately find myself being very uncomfortable with it because because um, we had a little argument today and I, I don't like to think about what is it like for her to be married and have to deal with me. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's a really important question because it's a question that opens up us, opens us up to understanding and even compassion for others. So, um, so being able to cultivate the skill of self-reflection is um, one of the ways that we can cultivate um, uh, good relationships with not just the people in our family, but people in the world, um, right. or even non-people and, and uh, animals puppies. and trees and natures <laughs> and puppies and, and the health of the planet um, by basically trying to see things from not just our own self-centered perspective, but the perspective of that which we are reflecting on. So in, a, in, in the current circumstances, this, this to me is extremely important. Otherwise, we just all kind of pull ourselves in and just harden our own perspective on, on um, the, what the problems are that the world is causing me, the world being this person and that person and the person at the grocery store and the person that didn't wear a mask and all these other people. And, um, and we ignore the fact that I'm leaving behind my own karmic residue as I go throughout my day. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. And I, uh, I haven't done a, a strict Nikon practice in a long time, but boy, I do remember that third question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just so, so, so hard. Because even when you know what you need to do to get there, mm -hmm. you're 
you're very resistant. Uh, I found myself always very resistant to that question. And I look back on my old gratitude, my old Nikon journal when we did we did it as a, a deep practice with bright dawn, and I know. <laughs> noticed that there was all this talking, uh, all this writing on the other ones. And the third one was like, like maybe two sentences. I really, I really had trouble with it. And that's and, the honest truth. <laughs> and, and um, for, for those of you whose practice includes um, the, uh, the Buddhist precepts, um, that third question uh, becomes the process for reflecting on the precepts. Um, exactly. That I actually went through this process in, in Japan, it's called Juju Kinkai, but it involves looking at each of the precepts and looking at how you violated that precept. Wow, so, yeah. um, so, as you, so your reflective practice, if you're working with the precepts becomes looking at the past day, um, how, did I commit, how did I commit lying? Yeah. How did I commit stealing, right? Um, uh, how did I commit intoxication? And um, as I was trained to work with those precepts, not in a literal way, but um, with some guidelines. So in, you know, when I first was asked to reflect on the precept of intoxication, which had intoxication with drugs and alcohol had never been a problem that I had really had in my life. And so I thought, oh, this will be easy, right? <laughs> but then I'm told, well, intoxication includes being intoxicated with your own ideas. And I thought, wow. now, I'm in, now I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm intoxicated with all my ideas, you know. So, of course we so are. It be, yeah. So, it, it, so as we work with those precepts, but again, it's this idea of um, being able to use, you know, some of our our energy within the um, this kind of environment to to reflect on ourselves, to reflect on how we're living, how we're treating other people, how we're conducting ourselves, and and what kind of legacy, you know, our day to day life is leaving behind. Uh, and I think that that's really an, an important thing to do. I think we we want to, I think many of us, if we think of it this way, we want to be able to look back at this period of time, whether 5, 10, 20 years from now, and be able to look honestly um, and, and say that you know, I, I lived through this time um, with integrity, right? Yeah. I conducted myself with integrity. Um, but we can't conduct ourselves with integrity unless we're reflecting on it during this period of time and looking at how we're not conducting ourselves with integrity. Um, so this is the time to essentially create your history, you know, as you think about this 20 years from now, by being able to, to reflect on yourself uh, in, in an honest kind of way now, so that you'll be looking back on this period in a very different kind of way. You know, that's, that reminds me, and I hate to drag this on any longer, but it's just, I, I read this uh, long piece about the 1918 pandemic, which is, you know, the closest thing we, you know, that's, that's you know, that's all we have mm -hmm. 100 years ago. And um, in, in one of the pieces said, the reason you, this piece said, was one of the reasons why you don't read much about the pandemic which you don't, it, it, it's, it's really from a literary point of view, it's very sparse as far as talking about, it. you can find the history and, but <clears throat> it was very sparse. Um, and one of the reasons uh, this, this, this person uh, um, postulated was that because, excuse me, so many people were um, embarrassed or um, did not like their attitudes during the pandemic because mm -hmm. they acted selfishly most of the time rather than compassionately that that no one wrote about it because uh -huh. it was it was embarrassing uh -huh. and then i read this other article and the, the recent article more recent article about how we sh we should be keeping journals about the pandemic uh -huh. because uh so and i've i i'm start i did i'm doing that um because and I'm trying to be as honest as possible about my outrage of non-mask wearers and everything. Uh -huh. um, because I think that is exactly, that's the kind of history, you know, history is not just history and facts. It's, it's how people dealt with it because it can be very instructive with how people deal with other hardships in their life. So I, I really took your point there on that. That's really an interesting way to look at it. I think uh -huh. from, 
Um, I think we want we need to write about this pandemic and not just mm. complain on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next one of yours was, and you I think you've already co covered this a bit, but if you want it, I'll just put it out there because I'm going to post this article in a uh, link to this article in my uh, show notes. But uh -huh. the next one of your points was to recognize the blessings that we encounter throughout the day. That's a, that's pretty much the gratitude practice. And, but if you, if you wanted to add something, you can, but I think this has really kind of been covered through all the other ones. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is I think it's a, a great way to look at our day is um, uh, that one of our tasks is to find moments of joy, right? ah, moments right. of joy. Um, it doesn't mean that the whole day is joyful, but, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, I, one of the things that, that I did when I was um, much younger is uh, I spent time working in refugee camps on the border of Cambodia and Laos. And I worked with refugees who are, who are living in, you know, huts that had dirt floors and no plumbing and, and, uh, and yet they were able to find joy in their lives. Right. And the children in those camps who, who had never existed outside of camps in some, some cases were able to play and find joy in their lives. And so um, even the most difficult circumstances don't have to prevent us from at least finding moments of joy. And, it, and at the end of the day, if you can think of one little experience that you had that was a joyful experience that made you smile or laugh or just gave you this, this nice uh, um, feeling about, about your life, that, that may be all that you can, can do. But I think it's a question of looking for it, right? Actually yeah. trying to find those moments of joy that's really important. Yeah, that's, 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 really, that's really great. And, and um, and you, you have a puppy, so you've got moments of joy all the yeah. time. <laughs> also moments of frustration. I understand it's a, it's a mixed bag, but <laughs> I, we, we had two puppies and I just, we just lost our, our last of the uh, know, sibling puppies. And um, your, your puppy talks are making me very sad right now and oh. making me want to go adopt a puppy, but I'm not going to do it. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so the next one of your, your uh, tasks that you suggest we, we take up is uh, to, it was a, like a two-parter, it was to act constructively and compassionately in the face of fear and anger and develop a sense of empowerment by taking action. I think you, we, you've also covered this, I mean, in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in your good uh, answers, but anything you want to add? Um, just that I think that um, there's, there's a great... Um, curative power that action provides us. In fact, uh, Joan Baez said that um, action is the antidote to despair. Wow, yeah. And, um, and so being able to look at a situation that we're in, any situation, and even if there's only one small thing you can do, um, and you, you never know what will come of that, right? We never know. We can't. Mm -hmm. But even if there's one small thing you can do, if you do it, it gives you a sense of empowerment. It gives you a sense that you you did something, right? Um, but if you don't do anything, that's what leaves us with the sense of powerlessness, right? That yeah. that we faced a situation. It was difficult. It was challenging. It was um, creating all kinds of problems and suffering. And if we don't do anything, it it gives us the sense of of being powerless. And that sends us right down this path of despair, despondency, right. depression, all these Ds, <laughs> the D <laughs> words. The um, D words, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do think that, you know, we shouldn't, as Buddhists who um, uh, are so, um, uh, how should I, saturated with the idea of quiet, you know, reflection and meditation and um, uh, sitting quietly, we shouldn't underestimate, you know, the active side of this and that action actually can be very um, purposeful. It can be very healing. It can be very spiritual. The entire Bhagavad Gita, one could argue, is really designed um, as an epic that talks about uh, the importance of knowing who you are and taking action based on who you are. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, we sometimes, when we pull wisdom from the East, we sometimes don't give enough attention 
to the action orientation or the active side of that wisdom because I think it, you know, we've, we've uh, so much needed the, uh, the side of things that have to do with, with meditation and, and quiet. But the action side is, is also very, very important. Yes, and that, and that that's so true. It, it, and it, it, it does, it, you know, it just, just the mere fact of it, when you do anything, um, I know in your taking action course, it's, I remember the, the phrase lead with the body. Um, mm -hmm. um, when you do anything, um, so many times we sit around saying, well, especially in this pandemic, it's like, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. I wish, but there's still a lot of things you can do, right? So mm -hmm. just, just lead with the body and do something like that you always wanted to do. I told, somebody said, um, how come that um, here I am, uh, I'm not working. I always wanted to clean the basement. And how come I haven't cleaned the basement? And it's, it's because, you know, probably because they didn't lead with the body. I, it's what I said, uh -huh. just go down and like take one box and do something with it. Uh -huh. That's all you have to do. Right. And you'll feel a lot better. So that's good. Thank you. And then the last one was to find something purposeful and meaningful to live for each day and probably not cleaning the basement, but you, you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and again, um, you know, how within the circumstances we're in, um, how do we find meaning in our lives, right? Uh, and uh, the person I always, if you want to read something, I, I always send people to Viktor Frankl because he yes. uh, he talks about doing this within the, within a, a Nazi concentration, concentration. camp. And, and uh, as challenging as our lives may, may be, we are not, uh, I, I don't think any of people listening to this are living in Nazi concentration camps. So it's very possible, even if you don't have a job or you've been laid off, even if you're separated from your loved ones, even if you're facing difficult illnesses, to continue to find meaning in your life. Um, and I think that's really important because it gives us something to wake up for in the morning, something that, that gets our energy going. And in Japanese, we use this term ikigai. Right, the guy yeah, yeah. is like you know the the reason for living or the purpose of of living. Um, so so sometimes when we're going through this kind of situation where everything is changing, um, uh, we have to find uh, a new purpose or a different purpose, right? And yeah. um, uh, when you have a, a death, in, including the death of a dog, I've gone through that myself. Um, you lose that purpose that you had. In, in caring for that animal. And you have to now find some way to find a new purpose to, to use that energy for, right? Yeah. For some people, it's, it's another dog. And for some people, it's something else. But uh, retirement is the same kind of thing, right? You yep. give up your purpose. You know, one of the most interesting things about transitions, and this actually comes from T.S. Eliot, is he said that, you know, that um, transitions begin with endings, right? We think of of things beginning with beginnings, but actually transitions begin with endings. Yeah. And, um, and so as something ends, um, that essentially opens up the doorway to a transition in our life. Um, and, and that's the point at which we have to think about um, what's my purpose in this situation? What can I be doing with my, my energy and my life and my time that will give meaning to this, to this time period of my life? Uh, it's, it's, you know, probably the most fundamental question that we've asked today, but it's, it's very important because um, it, it makes the suffering uh, worth it, right? Yeah. Um, if you don't have something meaningful or purposeful, it's very hard to, to accept the fact that you're suffering. But if you do, um, you still suffer, but, but it, it's worth it uh, to suffer because what you're doing is, is meaningful. Yeah, that's, that's so true. And, and, and it was good to, to, uh, to mention Victor Frankl, because he is, uh, he is definitely an inspiration. And I think people should read him if they haven't. So go and do that. Um, and then I wanted to share something uh, um, from an article, David Farley, who just wrote to me this week when he heard you were going to be on the podcast, I asked for, and instead of asking a question, he shared, uh, he says he's an avid podcast listener. And thank you, David. But he shared with me an article that he wrote for Newsweek. He's a, he's a, a, uh, uh, award-winning food and travel writer, and he writes for Newsweek, New York Times, and Wall Street Journal. He lives in New York City. And he wrote, the relief of uncertainty now, muses one New Yorker, 
for Newsweek. It's a great piece, and I'm going to post a link to it on the oh. show notes here. Um, but in his article, he quoted Camus, who wrote, everybody knows that pestilences have a way of recurring in the world, yet somehow we find it hard to believe in ones that crash down our heads on our heads from a blue sky, unquote. And then David went on to write, we're not used to living in an uncertain world where the possible near future outcome is death. But in these ambiguous, unlit times, there's also a huge opportunity here. It's key to accepting that we don't know how long this is going to last and that we very well might end up contracting the virus and even dying from it. Because even before this outbreak, nothing in life was ever certain. What's different now is that we've actually pulled back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz. We've shed the misconception of certainty. We didn't know what the future held for us a few months ago, and we don't know now either. In this sense, we're more grounded in actual reality today than we were in pre-pandemic times. The only certainty in this life is impermanence. And because he was inspired by you being on the show because he said he loved the show with you uh, earlier, by the way, so shout out to you. Um, um, so as I said, it's a great piece of writing, but what I think it brings up is something very important that I wanted to ask you about. And he said it the best way is that um, we're, we're more grounded in actual reality than we, we were in pre-pandemic times. Um, do you really believe, and I, I'm not sure where I stand on this. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I think I'm hopeful, but I'm not, I, I, I also think I shouldn't be. Um, but do you believe that this will help many of us be more grounded in actual reality than in pre-pandemic times, as David wrote? Or has it infiltrated the mass consciousness with a sense of right view in a Buddhist way? Or does it just cause more fear, divisiveness, or a sense of running away through Netflix binges? I mean, <laughs> where, where do you think this leaves us? I mean, I'm not asking you to predict, but yes, I am. So what do you think? <laughs> well, do, do we have another hour? Oh, no, we don't. <laughs> you have to give your gut quick. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I love the way he phrased that. And I, I actually too. would love to read, read the, his article. But I think his, his phrasing of that is... Wonderful, and I think that the the question is, you know, will we learn from this experience, right? Yeah, right. And um, if we learn from this experience, we move into whatever this transition is going to take us to. We move <laughs> into that um, next piece of our lives wiser and right. and better prepared to actually live well, right? Um, but if we see this simply as a blip, if this uncertainty is simply a blip, and then there's a vaccine and six months or a year or two years, whatever it is from now, you know, we're, we're not overly concerned about this and there's not that many people dying and we're back, you know, kind of hugging people and eating in restaurants and things, and we don't learn anything from this, right. um, then, then we haven't really um, been able to, to get much value from it. And I think that that, that the way he phrased it to me can simply become this is our challenge right is is to take with us you know what this this sense of uncertainty and be able to hold on to it even if if life begins to appear to have more certainty, certainty. To it. even even if the bubble starts reforming around us like going back to the first part and then you suggested that i ask my listeners uh, for questions and um you know, I have a lot of listeners, thousands of them, but I only received one questions from one oh. person other than David's response, which I thought was just awesome. Yes. Um, the, uh, but I received two questions from a listener named, I hope I get her name right, Olympica, um, who also said she's an avid listener. Thank you. Um, I hope I pronounced her name correctly, but she asked two questions. One was, uh, how does one navigate the uncertainty of not knowing what exactly their ideal career should be? This becomes all the more complicated when one wishes to align their life purpose with their profession. Now I'll jump in here because I was a career coach and, um, and suggest okay. that, because uh, <laughs> this is so career focused, Olymp suggest that Olympica uh, listen to two of my podcast episodes. Episode two, what is your why, which is about 
what your life's purpose and how you can channel it into career action or any kind of action. And episode 10, right livelihood is what you think about what you do uh, rather than what you do. Uh-huh. Do you have anything to add on that, que- her question? <clears throat> You know, the one thing that I would say is um, there's a, a Tibetan Buddhist story about um, a student who is uh, preparing to go into this um, room that's completely dark and is going to be uh, filled with demons, right? And they have to find their way to the other side of the, somewhere on the other side of this big room with demons, um, there's a door to get out. Right? And, uh, and the teacher tells them there's two things you need to remember. And the first thing is that the, the demons aren't real. Okay? But I guarantee you, once you're in the room with the demons, you'll forget that. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you the second thing, which is really important, because you're going to forget the first thing, and that is keep your feet moving. Right? So um, as long as you keep your feet moving, eventually you'll get to the door, right? Right. The thing you don't want to do is just stop and and not and stop moving. So, you know, my own sense about trying to navigate your way through is that it's much more like sailing, you know, where you keep tacking back and forth. There's no direct route. But um just keep keep um doing things, you know, experiment yeah. with this, try this, you know, go go to another country and try, you know, being a baker in, in Provence, France, or something like that. Just <laughs> You know, because as you do things, um, you'll learn what you like and what you don't like. And you can't learn that from thinking. Right? Yeah. So ultimately, you have to get your hands dirty. This, and, and I think um, a lot of the people I work with who are very smart have this idea that you can figure things out in your mind. <laughs> and so, um, so my suggestion is um, don't try to figure it out in your mind. Just keep your feet moving and just keep doing things and trying things. And and ultimately, you'll find something that at that point in your life, we'll, we'll, you'll say it's like trying on a coat. Wow, this really, this is a good fit. Yeah. And it's like, I, I tell my career coaching clients this all the time, is much like what you said about the tacking back and forth, uh-huh. is, is um, people, people tend to look at other people's careers as, wow, you know, they always knew what they were doing. They look, look where they ended up. And it's like, I, and I always tell them, I've worked with thousands of people over decades. And I can tell you not one of them, or very rarely, there's, you know, sometimes prodigies and stuff, but very rarely is, does somebody actually end up doing the thing they thought they were going to do. And it's like, th- this thing leads to that. And it's just this, this, this checkerboard kind of thing. And it's just, or, or like it's a quilt made up of all these different patches. And when, when as a career coach, I also do their resumes or their LinkedIn's or whatever, it's, it's my job is to tie a thread through the whole thing and make, make it look like there was a plan. But mm-hmm. most, most people didn't, it wasn't a plan. It was just jumping from one thing to the next and find out where you fit. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that was good, good advice there. I didn't even think of that. So, and her second question was, how do we know, which is some like what the first, I think, how do we know if we are taking the right decisions, especially when in the past things have not always turned in your favor? Can we still remain confident and keep peace with the fear of making mistakes? Uh And my first response is keep making mistakes. Uh, What's your response? (laughs) Yeah, I think, I think that's a great way to do it. Just, just to make as many mistakes as you can. Yeah. And and you you don't, you don't need to have, you shouldn't have confidence, right? You don't need to have confidence (laughs) and shouldn't have confidence. And, and uh, as Wendy knows, you know, I'm, I, I'm a, um, a blues pianist and, uh, uh, and I, I've written about the story the first time years ago when I actually decided to stop playing in my living room, or at least not only play (laughs) and actually get up on stage. And as I was walking up to the stage, I had no confidence whatsoever. You know, right. and now I'm playing in, in bands and we have outdoor, we have, we just had an outdoor concert last weekend. And uh, uh, so you don't, you don't have to have confidence to move forward and it's, it's fine to make mistakes. Um, so don't, don't be distracted by, by an ideal that somehow you need to be calm and confident and have equanimity and be able to handle things well and, um, and make sure that the outcome is beautiful and elegant that, that's all an imaginary ideal that many of us compare ourselves to and think, oh, I can't be like that. So don't even try to be like that. 
That, that's that's perfect, perfect, perfect answer. Absolutely. I remember just a piece of that from my experiences. I remember when I wanted to start this podcast, it was like this bug I had had. And actually a lot of people, family members and said, you should do a podcast. You should do a podcast because I came from broadcasting. So and I was teaching Buddhism. So it seemed like a good fit. And and so finally the bug got to me and bit me and I, I thought I should do a podcast. And and then when I when I started playing around with the podcast and testing my voice and doing all this stuff, you know, I thought I am not at all like these Buddhist podcasters. They have these sweet little voices and they sound like they're on a meditation cushion. And I'm this wild, gestury, loudmouth person. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, no, I can't be a Buddhist podcaster. So there you go. I did it. And, and I'm happy. So and but I wasn't confident. And I also thought I was doing it all wrong. So there you go. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, I, and from my standpoint, you're doing a great job. And you know, you, you are doing the best job of being a Buddhist Wendy Halet podcaster than any, <laughs> anybody in the universe, right? This, you, that, oh, you've, got right. This, you've got this down. I got it down. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I think uh, Olympica will get hers down, whatever it is she needs to do. That's right. So we better wrap this up before we, uh, before we go. Well, just two things. Is there anything I didn't ask that you would like to add? Um, no, I think you, you asked great questions, and uh, I think uh, I, I really appreciate just being able to have the conversation with you. Me too. I always love talking to you. And uh, the other thing before we close, would you like to share with us some of your upcoming online classes or workshops? You know, the plug zone. Uh, Dan Harris calls this the plug zone. Um, I'm going to plug some things on on uh, the show notes, like your website. And, and, but if you want me to plug an upcoming class or a workshop, uh-huh. feel free to talk about that. Well, the one thing that I can can mention that is uh, interesting is that um, I, we've been when, been running a certification training in Japanese psychology, uh, which I've been doing now for over 30 years. And it's a residential wow. program um, that people would come to the Toto Institute and it's nine days long. And this will be the first time in probably 32 years that we're not conducting that program on, as a residential program. And instead, what we've decided to do is to conduct the first third of the program online with the idea that then hopefully next year, people will come for six days and do the other two thirds of the program. And that's going to take place in September. Um, And uh, it includes three uh, morning sessions on weekends and also three individual sessions, um, one-on-one sessions that you'll have, which is also part of the way we do the training. So um, you don't have to be a mental health professional, but if you're interested in really um, uh, understanding and working with and practicing in your own life with, with a method of psychology that's kind of grounded in um, several different forms of Buddhism, then uh, this is the first time we've ever offered an opportunity to do that online. So I would uh, encourage the, the best thing to do would be to just contact me directly um, uh, Greg, G-R-E-G-G at totoinstitute.org. So I think, Wendy, you, ha- you have that address. Yeah, I'll put and, that on there. And if you just send me an email, I'll send you a link or I can send you more information about that. But we'll be doing that um, in the second half of September. Oh, that was, that was good. Actually, I have been looking at that because you know I've always wanted to take your, mm-hmm. I mean, have one, wasn't able to get away. Um, and maybe maybe if I start, maybe it'll happen. <laughs> right <laughs> just keep my feet moving right so well greg as always wonderful thank you so much for being on the show again and um i know this is going to be very helpful for so many people thanks yeah. again well thank you thank you so much for having me wendy and uh it, it's always a pleasure to talk with you and um uh you know there's been last thing i'll say to the, to the audience out there is uh Nobody really knows what's going to happen with anything. <laughs> However, <clears throat> um, you know, in the in history, uh, <clears throat> people have been faced with extremely challenging um, situations, situations that appeared hopeless. Right. Um, I when I, when I did a webinar recently on transitions, I use Lord of the Rings as um, as my example of of transitions. And one of the reasons that I love Tolkien's trilogy is because throughout the entire trilogy, um, the whole situation always seems hopeless. 
Right, exactly. And, and it's, it's like, the, to me, that's the main underlying theme of his trilogy is the situation is hopeless. And yet people keep pressing on and moving forward. And um, if you haven't read or seen the movies, I won't tell you how it ends. But, um, uh, but basically it means we can, we can come out of this. And uh, um, I'm, uh, I have my up and down moments, but I have, have yet to despair that somehow um, humanity will, will ultimately come out the other end of this. So um, just, just keep your feet moving. Keep going, as Reverend yeah. Coyo says too. That's the same, it's same, same message. Absolutely, so, yeah. so thank you so much, Greg. Once again, thank you, Wendy. Thanks again to Greg Creech for joining us today. Um, I thought that was a, a special episode, and I'm sure everything, every, I'm sure most of you got something out of it. That was six actionable tips, and in each of those tips were like uh, uh, detailed overviews of, of how to think about them, how to apply them in your life. Um, so, you know, suggestion may be to revisit this podcast a few times um, as we continue on during this time of great uncertainty. Um, but that's it. That's it for this episode. And as a reminder, don't forget that there are many ways to join me and others in either our private donation-supported everyday sangha, which meets every other week on Thursday evenings virtually at 7.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, or our free public open sangha, which at currently is meeting every week, alternating Tuesday afternoons at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, also virtually, um, with me, Wendy Shinyo, or Rob Kanyo-sensei, um, hosting on Tuesdays or and on Wednesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. with Levi Shinyo Sensei. Stay tuned for an announcement about this because we may be um, stretching out the time between these open sanghas um, and making them more like once a month, but uh, we'll make sure you know about that. Um, that's it for the housekeeping at the end of this session, and until next time, keep finding ways to make yours and everyone's days better. <laughs>